let's let's pray and we'll get to get to the morning. Father, thank you um, just for your grace uh, toward us, your love for us. Really, most obvious and demonstrated in sending your own Son, who would suffer in our place for our sin, that we might live with you forever. That is, um, man, for a people that didn't deserve it, and, and what a gift you have given to us, and, and that's certainly a demonstration of grace. Uh, my God, I also think of all the, all the other things you've provided for us and continue to provide for us. Uh, I just, uh, I want to thank you for those things and, and ask that those things would be called to mind and would sort of... Um, become worship and become gratitude in our hearts uh, towards you. So uh, just thank you. And God, for this week, look into family camp and just the exciting week that this is for us and the fun that we have. We just want you to be glorified in all of it. And so I'm just grateful for that, grateful for the anticipation of what we have coming this week. And just ask that you would bless it, be present with us, and that um, you would just do remarkable things at camp. We love you deeply, in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, we are doing something a little different this morning. Uh, We've never done this before. We've taken the weekend before family camp to kind of talk about why family camp, answer some questions about it, and then walk through the schedule. So we're doing something a little weird. I, I was... Uh, I, I jokingly uh, referring to this as sort of a pep rally, but just kind of hyping it up, right? But we don't, and we're not going to, you know, do crazy stuff unless you've got something planned. No, okay, good. Um, but we want to be able to, to, to anticipate it. What we've done in the past is we've always reflected on it. We've given the Sunday after camp to reflect back, to look back on what God has done. But what does it look like to look forward and anticipate what God is going to do? So this is kind of, kind of new for us. We're hoping for a couple of things. One, uh, a, a couple of things. One, we just want to make family camp as accessible as possible. And so part of the purpose today is to try to answer all of those questions so that whatever barriers you might have to coming up, whether you're camping for the weekend or just coming up or wanting to come up for just one of the days, we want to make sure that we, we've done everything we can to remove all of those barriers. Um, and some of them are easy. You know, when just where do we park? Where is the camp? Some of those barriers are, are super easy. I would also say this is often a barrier. Uh, people go to register and go, I don't, I don't know, that's a, that's a lot, or maybe we don't have the finances this year to go to camp. Um, so I, I want you to think about the barriers you have to going to camp. And I'm just asking, is there anything that the church, and by that I don't mean just the pastors, I mean the church, is there anything the church can do about that? Okay, so I think about the uh, financial question. If finances are a barrier, is there anything you think the church can do about that? Yeah, that one's easy. Okay, I do not want finances to be the reason somebody doesn't go to camp. Okay, some of the barriers are more difficult, and we can do our best and lean into them, but I, I think of uh, fear or social anxiety as a people's, if you're relatively new, or maybe you're just not really comfortable around lots of people, it, it, there can be a big barrier of fear. Is there anything that we can do about that? Well, maybe. My, my, my point is, is, what is the barrier for you if you're not going, why? What's the barrier? And is there anything that can be done about it? And is there any way that the church might help? I would say regarding the fear, I would say, um, well, first I think I'd say you're probably not the only one. Uh, large groups of gathering, uh, uh, large gatherings, large groups of people are often quite frightening for lots of people. So you're, you wouldn't be the only one. And then secondly, I would just say, what, what would it look like? What would you need? What would it look like to, for us to be courageous together and lean into something that might be frightening? So anyway, the point is, what's the barrier for you? And is there anything that can be done about that? So that's one of the hopes for this morning, is to try to eliminate the barriers so that family camp is more accessible to more people and, and easily accessible. The second hope is this. The second hope for this morning, looking to family camp rather than looking back on it, is to recast the vision of why, so it it becomes much more than just a weekend of recreation and just added to the list of camping trips for the summer. Um, It's it's different. And so we want to recast the vision a little bit of what family camp is about, and then hopefully uh, stir a a little excitement uh, for what we've got 
going. So that's, that's the hope. So by way of vision, if you're a part of Valley Life and been around for some time, back in February, we had a, a vision Sunday where we sort of put out these big goals that we want to just keep out in front of us and be aiming towards these throughout this year. One of those was in regards to increasing um, informal gatherings that we saw an, a value in more informal gatherings, meaning that we're gathering just to hang out so that people can connect relationally. And so we started a, a potluck. We had one earlier. We had one in the spring. We had one, an outdoor uh, picnic scheduled for uh, July that got canceled. And, and then, of course, family camp also fits that. Informal uh, gatherings where people can just relationally connect. We, t- we said back on Vision Sunday that we were going to double down on family camp. We've done it for a lot of years. We're going to double down on it. We think the value of what, we, what, what is accomplished in that weekend alone in all the weekends of the year is hard to quantify what it means for us to go and, and, and camp uh, together. So uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's a big piece of our calendar. Um, just really see the value of opportunities to both know and be known. It's a big part of what it means to be a church, okay? And then, of course, to stir some excitement. Uh, This is the largest registration maybe ever already. And um, and so this is going to be the biggest event. I think the rec field where it was kind of the, if you remember last, from last year, if you were here, kind of became uh, family camp central, that and lakeside during the day. But um, man, I think we've near doubled the amount of people tr- in, that, in that field. So we're, we're packing the place out, using all the corners. We're excited about that. But it's, we're also up in our game a little bit. And so uh, we'll get to some of those details. But I, for one, am super excited about what we have planned uh, for the year. Um, in the past, it's just been a weekend where we don't have anything planned. And we just sit by the river and hang out, which is great. Uh, we moved to family camp. And it's so vast, we realize people are scattered all over the place. We needed to add a little bit of programming to pull people together because we're so spread out. So we have all of these things planned to sort of pull us into same space. And uh, really looking forward to what we have, and we'll share some of that with you. So let's, let's hit a couple of questions. What is family camp? Why family camp? That's where we'll spend most of the time, and then we'll get to the how, we'll get to the details. And I'm going to have uh, Steve and Tyler come join me for that. First, the what. This one's simple. What is, what is family camp? Uh, quite simply, it is a weekend where our church family goes camping. Okay, there it is. It's, it's not complicated. But the reason we need to bring it up is there is a very common misconception that comes up about family camp all of the time. And we'll hear this. Well, my kids are grown. Or, well, I'm not married. Or we don't have kids. Um, so it's a very common misconception. We're not using family in that, re- in that regard. We love your family, we love your kids, and we love you if you don't have kids. That's not the point. Family camp is our church family. That's how we're using the word. It's not for families. It's for our family, singular. Okay, that's how we're using the word. Family camp, one, family, our family, church family, going camping. So uh, it doesn't matter if your kids are grown or whether you're married or not or whether you have kids or not. Are you a part of this church? Is this home? Is this your family? Yeah, we're going camping. That's, that's the what. That one's super easy, but again, I think that becomes a barrier for some because they have preconceived ideas of what fam, how we're using that word family. So I don't know if we need to change the name or not. I just, we want to be clear. It's, it's our family, our church family, going camping. That's what it is. Okay, now why? We've been studying through uh, the book of Genesis for quite some time now, and one of the recurring themes that comes up among many. One of the recurring themes comes uh, from Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where God says to Abraham, he says, in you or through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And thematically, it keeps throwing back to that. As we continue the study, we keep seeing that everything that God is doing is, is showing glimpses of what it looks like for a particular family to bless all of the families of the earth. And you see that that's a very early sort of picture of what God intends to do with the church. Okay, now in Abraham, through Abraham, we know that it's ultimately about Christ, that through Abraham's lineage would come Christ, who would die on the cross in our place for our sin and would by faith bless all of the families of the earth. 
But we also know that God gave and formed the church in and through Christ to be that new family, that new heritage. And through that heritage, the church, all of the families of the earth would be blessed as we continue to proclaim the name of Christ and demonstrate the purposes of Christ in this world. So if we look at it from a glance, you see Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God created everything, and then he stepped back from what he created, and he looked upon it, and he assessed it, and he said, it is, it's very good. Chapter 1, verse 31. Then chapter 3, Adam and Eve kind of have their own ideas about what they're going to do, and they seek to build their own kingdom rather than to see God's kingdom established. They seek to establish their own kingdom, and in so doing, introduced sin to the world, and Romans 5 is pretty clear that in Adam we all transgressed. So we're all sinners in Adam. So that's all of us. We've all fallen and sought our own kingdoms instead of the kingdom of God. And then in Genesis chapter 4 through 6, we see this uh, worsening. You know, Adam and Eve sin, and then it looked like from 4 to chapter 6, it just seems to be getting worse. And some of the imagery used in Genesis is just getting further and further and further away from Eden, further east. Just this worsening. Just gets worse and worse and worse until God um, sort of hits this shocking text where it says he regrets even making man. And that's a fascinating thing to ponder as you consider the, the omniscience of God, that he's all-knowing, the sovereignty of God, that he would regret anything. It's an interesting thing to ponder. But he regretted, at least in our terms, he regretted making man, so sent a flood to do what Stephen Jeffries, a theologian, calls the decreation that God decreated with the flood to recreate. And that's the picture of new creation in the New Testament that we get. But that's the idea. That God decreated with the, with the flood, and then after the flood, you, you, it just doesn't take long, and we're just back to, back to the same old, same old stuff. Seeking to make a name for ourselves. Build towers with their tops in the heavens at Babel in Genesis chapter 11. And it's not about God and accomplishing and establishing his kingdom. It's about accomplishing and establishing our own. And so God comes down, if you remember, in Genesis 11, and he confuses their language. If in one language you're going to do all of these things and you're going to build towers with their tops in the heavens, then I'm going to come confuse that language and spread you out over the face of the earth. And so he does that. And this is the birth of the nations the birth of all of those families that through Abraham, God was going to bless all of them. That's Genesis chapter 11, and that gets us to Genesis 12, where God, among all of the families of the earth, he picks one family, Abraham's family, and he picks them and says, through you, I'm going to bless all of the families of the earth, and I'm going to do that work through you. And we've been studying as of late the lineage of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and that's where we have sort of left off. So what does that assume? If God is going to pick one family from among all the families of the earth and he is going to bless all of the families of the earth in and through that one family, what does that assume? Well, lots of things, but particularly for this morning, it assumes that God loves diversity. He likes differences. He likes variation. We tend to, like the people in Babel in Genesis 11, we tend to like to huddle up with our own people who are like us and see towers built. And we, we tend to do, and, and, and God just wants us to fill the earth. You fill the earth, it just assumes broad, diverse culture. You, I mean, you just think about the cultures that would be expressed in just different parts of the world because of the different climates that we live. I mean, you could talk about all of the reasons why we live so differently culturally just based on our geography why certain areas are more agricultural than others, and others are, like just our geography presents us with different cultures. I mean, but you start listing those things, and go, man, there are lots and lots and lots of variations, yes. So sociologically, as best as I was able to determine, there are more than 5,000 distinct culture groups in the world today. 5,000 distinct culture groups, um, more than. And then this number, which can't be quantified really, and then it's just this in, innumerable, is the quote, innumerable subcultures within those distinct cultures. Okay. We're, we're very, very different depending on where you are in, in the world. Very, very different. I remember years ago, 
I was in Manchester, England. We, uh, Sarah and I were in England uh, going to a conference. And I don't know if it was a taxi driver or Uber driver. I can't remember what service. But we were just, he was a chatty fellow. And we were driving to wherever we were going and he was just talking and we were answering questions and da-da-da. And we were getting out of the car and this is what he said. He said, I love your accent. Now, as an American that was, uh, who doesn't travel abroad very often, uh, that, was, that was a new experience for me. You love my accent? I mean, we talk about the British accent all the time. I mean, shoot, our smartphones and all the TV shows, all the smart people have cool accents. And then there's us, you know, Americans. With our, okay, so I, I never expected in my life to ever hear, I love your accent. I figured, I, I don't know, I've got, I got nothing going on. But here, here, what, here was a situation where he was recognizing a difference. You don't sound like us, and I like it. It was not just, oh, you're different. It was, you're different, and it's good. Well, it wasn't, you're different, and it's okay. No, it was different, and it, I actually love it. It's good. And, and particularly as relates to that, that was a new experience for me. I loved his accent, too. And here we are sharing a language for a moment, just appreciating the difference in the dialect, in the, in, in the accent, depending on where we live. I think that's a picture of the church. What does it look like to share language but, but have different accents? I, I, I think that's a picture of the church. Now, okay, whoa, I'm going to trip on Who left their shoes up here? Okay. <laughs> I get, this, I get this picture. Now, I think about all the denominations that we have worldwide. And now look, certainly um, there are some movements that we, we need to be concerned about and step back because I'm not sure where we are. We do share a language, if you know what I mean. Like, we, we do, we, this isn't a, a plea for just whatever is, it goes. We share an actual language. And that language matters. I'm talking about the different accents. These variations, these distinct dialects, depending on where we live or what our background was like or where we grew up, where we have different expressions of whatever. What does it look like to share a language but have diverse accents? And is that not a part of the intended purpose of the church? I, I tell you, it disarms some of the looking at other denominations and going, I don't know if that's right. Kind of disarms that a little bit. And maybe I could look and say, man, I never thought about it from that perspective. That, that, that challenges me in my thinking. And man, I love your accent. I love your accent. I don't, right? Like there's something about that to where, yes, one language, there's one language but many expressions or accents within that language. I think it's a beautiful picture of the church. That was a, a thought that was expanded from something I got from this whew, book that I, I started. It's called Cultural Intelligence. Improving your CQ, that's your, your cultural in, intelligence quotient. Improving your CQ to engage our multicultural world. And so it's a lot of data. It's a, it's a weighty read, but I'm thoroughly enjoying it. And, and I'm finding that, whoa, as a pastor, there is a desire to, to be more loving towards people who are different than me. But I'm recognizing as I'm reading it as a pastor that the difference between the desire to love people who are different than me and the actual expression of that love for people who are different than me is still quite a gap. And I think for us, there's still that kind of a gap, particularly when you live in parts of the country that are, for, in large part, fairly homogenous. It's like we don't have a lot of ethnic diversity in Lebanon. So what does it look like to start going, well, but th that doesn't mean, though, that everybody's the same. Even within our context, geographically, there are differences. There are different accents. And what does it look like? I can appreciate how someone else lives, what does it look like to more than from a distance have a desire to love that person and actually be able to step up to that person and actually begin to express that love? That's hard for us. Let's all be honest. We like to be with people who are like us. It just feels safer. I don't feel like I'm going to say something stupid or look funny or wear Birkenstocks with socks and apparently that's a problem. Like, 
We just like to be with people who are like us. It makes us feel safe. But God is doing something different. He, with his people, he, is select, he selected Abraham from among the families of the earth to what? To bless all the families of the earth in and through Christ. Today, the church is the real fulfillment, if you will, of that vision to see all of the families of the earth blessed through the church, the family proclaiming the Christ who came and died. Like, it's remarkable. And God intends for us to be different different from one another on purpose on purpose um livermore david livermore in this book um which was in, incredibly timely i started reading it last week and he opens by talking about the incarnation of christ that jesus stepping out of glory and putting on flesh to dwell among us is the ultimate example of closing the gap between cultures of saying god just didn't have a desire to love people who were different than him what did he do he put on flesh and he stepped into that space and gave the ultimate expression of what it means to actually love someone who is different and i'm like man we've been talking about the incarnation of christ as the fulfillment of that vision in our study of genesis and then he goes on to start talking about the in between the already the not yet which we've been spending the last two weeks talking about specifically as relates to what is it like to live in a space where jesus says it is finished yet it doesn't feel finished it still feels broken it still feels like we're walking around with a limp i thought you said it was finished doesn't look finished We've been talking about the already and the not yet the last couple of weeks. And he spends time talking about the already and not yet and how that looks geographically and how that looks culturally with all of our ethnic and, and, and divides and racial divides that we often have and struggle with. This doesn't look finished. It's not fulfilled. It's not. So we live in that tension. So super timely read. Um, so I'm really appreciating it. But he makes this argument out of Hebrews 1. I'll put this on the screen. This is one of my favorite passages. You want to talk about a way to open a book. This is fantastic. So, a letter written to Jewish Christians, Hebrews. He starts with this. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Now, that's meant to get an amen because you go, yeah, that's true. And you look back, and we've been studying Genesis, so we've been studying the fathers, and we've been looking back at that culture and that Jewish heritage. We've been looking, oh, yep, he, he has. In many ways, God came and he spoke to our fathers, Jewish fathers, and, and in a variety of different ways. Yes and amen. That's meant to be emphatic. To where you would say, yeah, God, the creator of the universe, spoke to our fathers. It's supposed to be big. But it's teeing up what's bigger. Look at this in verse 2. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Okay, this is meant to be like, you thought that was awesome. Yeah, today this is how he's doing it. He is speaking to us in son. He says uh, almost, uh, uh, most literally you can translate this passage in son. God has in these last days spoken to us in son and then he says this and i quote the language god's language is jesus god's language is jesus and so i'm, I'm having this uh, thought and i'm thinking about family camp and i'm going okay so what does it look like for the language to share a language but to have diverse accents so that that guards us because it's not as if one church's language is jesus and another church's language is something else church listen to me as the church, if God's language is Jesus, what's the language of the church, his church? Okay, it's not a trick question. Okay, it's, it's Jesus, right? But the expression of we can share the language and yet have different accents to where we might find ourselves visiting another church. They have a different style of music or, or the pastor dresses funny or whatever. And we can go, man, I can appreciate that. I, can, I, can, I love your accent. You know, we, we'll have people come and, and visit here and, and comment on, on various things. I don't know how many comments we've received on, that, on the doxology at the end of service where we just sing a cappella together and close the service out. We do that every week. It's become normal to us, but people, that's one of the things we get, man, what is that? That was beautiful. Do you guys practice that? I got one time. Do you guys practice that? Because it sounded so good. Okay, well, that's a stop. I love your accent. I came and visited Valley Life, and I'm like, I love your accent. But you... 
We're definitely speaking the language of Jesus. Or you go to a place and go, okay, Jesus is the language here, but look at the accent. I love the accent. You see that? That's the church. That we do that individually, where we together share the language of Jesus. But man, you grew up different than I did. You don't look quite the same as I love your accent. And God is putting something on display on purpose. And I, I, I love that. What does that have to do with family camp? everything. Jesus said this to his disciples, which by the way, without preaching another sermon, I got to get moving. I know you're sweating over there. Okay. When Jesus picked his disciples, did he pick a bunch of guys who were all the same? Oh goodness, no. I mean, he in fact picked some of his guys to be those 12 among the 12 who would in all other circumstances that would have been enemies. This is the kind of like, I'm not living next door to you. I'm selling my house. I'm moving. That kind of, and he called them on purpose. And he picked guys to be the guys that would together, empowered by the Holy Spirit, would turn the world upside down. And they were not the same. In fact, he challenged them just by picking the ones he picked. Was that, that was challenge one. They had lot, the disciples had lots of challenges in their three-year discipleship journey with Jesus. There were lots of challenges. The first one, traveling with that guy. That was the first one. Having to hang out with that guy. Why did you call him? Why him? Come on, seriously? I could have given you 10 names better than that one. See, that kind of thing. No, God did it on purpose. That was, that was the first challenge. See that? It's intentional. And God told this ragtag group of dudes, not the same at all. Right before he's arrested, this is the end of the three years, right before he's arrested and then crucified, he gathers them together in this time where he's just spending time with the 12. And he said, look, he says this in John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. And if you've been walking, if you're familiar at all with those three years, what it looked like for Jesus to love them, you get a little bit of an idea of what he's calling them to do. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And then look at this. By this, all people. Well, that throws all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 when we're talking about all the families of the earth. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Because, you know, we're not doing that very well anywhere else. But the church of God, to have people that, are, that share a language but do not share an accent and for the world to look around and go, man, you guys didn't grow up the same. You didn't, you didn't live the same. You weren't, didn't grow up in the same denomination or go to the same kind of church. You didn't grow in the same kind of family. Your parents were divorced. Your parents weren't. You're, all the, let's rattle out the list. We are not the same. And yet, God throws them together and says, these are my people. More than that, he says, this is my family. And the way that you love one another amidst all of those differences is going to put something on display that the world does not have a box for. What does that have to do with family camp? Everything. It might just be the one camping trip in your summer where you were camping with people you wouldn't normally. That's not an accusation. I get it. We, ha- we have our friends. That's good. Keep doing it. I love it. I'm just saying there is an ex- a particular expression of the church that is different, and it's on purpose. I, 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 I love that diversity in the pictures of fire pits and, you know, of people sitting in camp circles that are just not, they're not the same. They're not on the same stage of life. These people don't have young kids. These people don't have kids at all. These, kid, these people are running around chasing a million. They're just not the same. And yet, we share a language. You start talking about Jesus, I understand you. But I love your accent. I love your accent. And that accent is a gift to the church. This is what I want you to do. I'm going to show a video from last year's family camp. So this will be a throwback to what we did last year. But this is what I want you to do. If God's intention is to establish, all the way back to Genesis 1 and 2, to establish his kingdom on earth, in and through us, 
He's going to establish his kingdom. What did that kingdom look like in Genesis 1 and 2? Well, very good was his assessment. Very good. There is a shalom that the establishment, a peace of God in the establishment of his kingdom it, that is meant to be introduced in and through us. The church should be that picture within the, this fallen world. The church should be that place where we're starting to see glimpses and pieces of the, pe- the peace of God in this world, which is, you know, far cry from peaceful. The church is meant to be the expression of the kingdom of God in the already and the not yet as we're beginning to see glimpses of the kind of peace God's kingdom is meant to introduce. And so I want you to watch this video and I just want you to spot shalom. I want you just to look for glimpses of peace. Okay. love that. And I think as you look and you see, it's, this isn't just recreation. It is so, so much more than recreation, than just recreation. Why don't you guys come on up? I have uh, Pastor Steve and Pastor Tyler come up. We're going to, I'm going to allow them to kind of share their thoughts a little bit too. Um, we talked about what do we focus on? And we're going to talk about the why of family camp. There's so many things that we could talk about. So I'm going to have them sort of uh, add their two cents in on it as well. And then we're going to talk details and hopefully stir some uh, anticipation and some excitement. But uh, that's, that's the hope in these next minutes. So anything you would add right out off of those things, because I wandered off my notes. So it's almost like we had a conversation and I went a totally different direction. So any thoughts you have to add to the random thoughts I shared? So just so you know, Birkenstock has their own brand of socks. <laughs> So it's not a bad thing to wear socks with Birkenstocks. Oh, okay. No. All right. So don't let them give you a hard time. All right. <laughs> I'm over it. No, seriously, I am. Wait till next week. Hmm. 
Okay. Do you, do you want to start, though? No, go ahead. Oh, like, okay. Any thoughts right. on, on that? Because I know yeah. I, I didn't share the same I did in first service. Like, I kind of went for it in a different direction. Yeah, so um, I think as we get older, as well as I get older, um, I don't think I'm ever re going to regret that I didn't watch more episodes of Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune. Um, I think by the time that I've reached the end of my days, I probably will have seen thousands of episodes. And uh, really, there's two kinds of people in the world. There's those who like Pat Sajak and those who don't like him. <laughs> you just told me I could wear socks. Now I'm questioning whether or not I can wear socks with Sandy. <laughs> All right, here's my point, though. Love we will accent. never regret the time we've spent with other people. The time we had to walk in this world and this life with other people, to get to know them, to be with them in community, uh, to meet a new friend. I, I'm amazed over the years uh, how many people that I've met who become such close friends. And when we met, we, we sort of met by chance. Like we had a chance meeting and then we met them. For example, last century, like the end of the 1990s, I got to meet Steve Annabelle, who was the camp director at Camp Tadmore, where we're going. And uh, he became one of my closest and dearest friends over the years. And um, he went to be with the Lord in like 2011 or 2012. But I'll never regret all the time we had to spend together during all those years. And so we meet up with people at Tadmore, we do life together, uh, and, and we just don't regret that because I think that's probably why God put us on, the, on, the, on earth, to be with one another and to spend time with other people. Absolutely. I don't know. Well, no. Are you muted? Nope. Can you hear me? Nope. Take, it, take Steve's mic. Oh, look at this. Thanks for your technological help. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, I, I was just going to say, like, I think, I think you nailed it, but I think like, we need to recognize that we were wired and designed to do life as a church. So so much more than the Sunday morning hour and a half, get together, sing songs, <laughs> drop things. You started throwing things and it just set a trend. I know, sorry. Uh, but like we were, we were wired for that. And so it's not like we're, we're going up and doing something. What is this all about? Like it can be scary. Like I recognize that, um, especially certain personalities. But I don't know how many of you uh, grew up in the summertime like going and finding a, a deep enough spot of water with something high enough to jump off of and go in because of the rush of it. Like, okay, perfect. First service, there was one person that raised their hand. And I was like, well, that's lame. This isn't going to land very well. But, um, but like, it but will we never... loved their accent. Yeah. But we love their accent. We love their accent. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I remember doing that in like middle school and high school. And the first time you go out and then you watch someone else that's going to do that for the first time, you watch people jumping off of a cliff into a river and you're like, that's nuts. And for a while you just kind of stand off on the side and you watch long enough and you see like, man, that's kind of scary, but they look like they're having a blast. Uh, I, I, want, I want some of that. I want, to, I want to, to try that. I remember growing up in Texas, it's funny because you go here in Oregon, you jump in the water and it's like, this is way too cold. Why are you guys doing that? You're idiots. That's what I thought like the first three years I lived here. Uh, but then in Texas, we would like check the water to make sure there was no water moccasins swimming across before we jumped in. But the water wasn't cold, so it was fine. Um, either way, jumping into water, jumping into new things can be scary, um, but usually always like worth it. So I want you guys to, to consider coming up to family camp. Like you can either sit back and watch everyone else have fun or jump in, like, like recognizing that um, because of Jesus, you matter and you belong, and we're designed to have that community that's not not just a Sunday morning thing, but, but a, a week-long, year-long, long thing. So. And on top of that, Tadmore is a beautiful spot. How many of you have already been to Tadmore at some point? A lot of you have been there. It's a beautiful spot. I grew up in Southern California. We thought camps were military bases. That's what we had. I mean, really didn't have camps. And that's not <laughs> totally true because I did camp in the Redwoods once, but... Uh, uh, it's just beautiful up there, and you might come up, 
And, and, and if you're like, well, what am I going to do when I come up there? What am I going to do? Well, you can just walk around and enjoy the beauty of Tadmore. And then if you look kind of like you're lost, one of us that has not met you yet is going to go up and introduce ourselves to you and get to know you a little bit. We want to get to know you. We want to know your name uh, and, and just get to know you a little bit and enjoy the camp together. It's a beautiful, beautiful camp. They, they actually have a really challenging Frisbee golf course. If some of you, we're going to do that, right? Yeah, we're going to do that. So if some of you are like into Frisbee golf, they have a really challenging one of the holes is like across the lake. You got to go across the lake. Saying Frisbee golf is like wearing socks with Birkenstocks, though. It's yeah. disc golf. Oh, it's disc golf. Yeah, okay. But I love your accent. <laughs> You're like in the, in the Frisbee golf club. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you this. And this, I'm going to ask, those of you who've been to family camp before, I want you to answer this for yourself as well. It, with regards to what are some of the, um, some of the things you love about uh, family camp? Some of the things that stand out as highlights to you. I want you to populate a list for yourself. I'm gonna, through a couple of different lenses, I want you guys to consider the same question, but what do you love about it as a pastor? What do you love about it as a church member? And maybe as a father or grandfather. So like, think of it through the different lenses and give me a couple of things you love about family camp from those different perspectives. Yeah, I like that. I think as a pastor, I love family camp because it really feels like a springboard into community with the church. Like it's, it's easy to, like I was saying, slip in Sunday morning, slip out, um, figure out how you can <laughs> fake it to, to be good enough through Sunday. But like camping for three days with people, um, you get a feel and a taste for, oh, we're supposed to do life in community. Like I, I'm tapping into something that I was wired for. And I think as a pastor, I love watching people get connected. How many people found a community group or found a group of friends that they are really real with um, because they started talking around a fire at family camp, almost because they were forced to in a good way. It was a good, a good push to community. And they found like, man, I need this. I need this in my life. And so, so I love seeing that. I love seeing just like the church, I think, operating more how it originated. Like it wasn't, it was never just a Sunday morning thing. I was, uh, we were talking about um, Acts chapter 2 after Pentecost and um, uh, Peter preaches that, that sermon uh, that saves like 3,000 people and they get baptized. And then at the end of Acts chapter 2, I wrote the verse down, 46 and 47, um, he says that the people um, devoted themselves to meeting in the temple, but also to meeting day after day and breaking bread in their homes um, and, and doing so, eating their food together with a joyful and a sincere heart. Um, and I think the church needs more of that, like joyfully and sincerely, genuinely uh, gathering together, eating food together. And we are going to eat. I mean, we'll get to that in a little bit, but Hold Saturday on. night we are going to have a feast of biblical proportions, as we said in the first service. I don't uh, know what that means, but it yeah, sounds big. That might not be okay to say, but it feels like it. Um, I know, yeah. And, uh, and he goes on to say that they just praise God and enjoying and they enjoyed the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number. So what does it look like to respond to God in a way that says, man, we want to celebrate and do life with these people more than just Sunday mornings. Like I want, I want from family camp people to see the value of community group, people to see the value of, of being known and knowing others and still being fully loved because that's exactly how we are loved in Christ. So pa as a pastor, I think that's what sticks out for me. And community goes beyond just spending time together. It means people within the group actually helping one another in their lives when they have difficulties or they have needs. Yeah. And then I just hear like so-and-so is helping so-and-so to do this or that. And I didn't make a phone call or say anything. They're just helping one another within the community. That is really a cool thing. And then um, for me last but certainly not least is Watching the kids have fun is just <laughs> so invigorating for me in so many ways because we all need to be reminded that Jesus said, let the little children come to me and learn from them because theirs is the kingdom of God. And uh, last year, I, this, this little person was walking near the lake and they were covered with mud. I mean, you couldn't even see their face. It was from head to toe. And so I grabbed my camera and I took a picture of them and I'm looking around like, 
whose parents belong to this kid, you know? I mean, they are just like a mud blob. And I found out it was Annie, Tyler's daughter. <laughs> and I just, um, I love being around kids. I'm a teacher uh, full time. And, and uh, there's just something for us kind of like uh, crusty old people, you know, like get off my lawn people. Uh, that we, we need <laughs> to be around kids that are just living life and enjoying life and just getting muddy. I just love that. I, uh, one of the things that sticks out to me, I think, as a pastor is every year, I, I, I just look around and, and the little side conversations I see happening all over camp. Somebody, at, you know, waiting for the kid to change in the bathroom to go down to the lake or they're getting a stroller or helping get something out of a car. Like I'm watching conversation going, I've never seen the two of them have a conversation before. And I just, I just love that. Like seeing people at, sitting and, and sharing a meal or sitting at a fire pit with somebody that I've never seen them with that person before. And as a pastor, I'm going, there is another touch point, touch point, touch point, touch point, touch point, touch point. And if God is accomplishing the mission of God to make disciples in and through relationship, how valuable are touch points? Like it's the currency. It's the currency. And so I, I, I love that. Talk about it as a dad or, or a grandpa in your, in your case, Steve. Or my case, too, I guess. Huh? They're both grandpas. I'm not. Um, <laughs> is that what do they call it? A pregnant pause? I don't know. How you say that. Uh, man, as a father, I love family camp. Uh, not only because my kids have been looking forward to this probably since we left family camp. Um, <laughs> But I love that we talk about often like how important community is for us adults and all these things. But community is so important for our kids. Um, and so they're learning from a young age, like I belong to a family. I have community. I can be honest. I can, and they need help with this. But that I can be honest with them. They can be honest with me. And they're not known and loved because they performed well enough. They're not known and loved by their friends because they've proven to be good enough but because of Jesus. And, and I think our kids desperately need that. And they're making a habit, in a sense, of, of needing community as they grow up. Um, and that matters a lot. And also, their memories of being with their church family are yeah. the highlight yeah. of their life. Um, it's not some boring place where they go and have to pretend to be like their little goody two-shoes. Like, they, they know they're not. Everyone else knows they're not, but they're still loved. And... Uh, they're excited about being a part of church. So I like Form, that. Forming attitudes, like in young minds, forming attitudes about the church at camp. It's, it's fantastic. Love it. I think um, with my kids over the years, they're all growing up and moving out, but, you know, there are, there are times where just, you know, you would schedule you know, time for a friend to come over or for a play date if your kids are young and all this. That with our kids, there's this motivation to get them together and to make sure they're with their friends. And yet so often in our culture, our culture for adults is pushing us online and, and removing us from actual people and pushing us to the online world. Like, what would it be like for you to schedule a play date for yourself? Do, do we do that? Do we have the same drive to be with a friend or to be with our community as maybe our kids often times express? So uh, I think it really challenges us culturally in pretty significant ways. Anything, finally, we got to switch to the schedule. Anything you would add, particularly for people who, let's say they've never gone to family camp before or, or might be relatively new to our church, what would you say? As just an encouragement to maybe consider camp. Just jump in. Just jump in and, and, and be real, be authentic. I mean, I think <laughs> it, it's cool to be, I mean, when you're up there long enough, you can't. <laughs> you can't fake like you have it all together. I certainly can't. At some point in the trip, like, one of my kids is going to spill my coffee in my lap or something. Like something's going to happen and someone's going to see, oh, he's, he gets irritated with that. Of course I do. Like we get to all see that we're all real. Uh, we're not just putting on a mask and putting on a show. We're all real. And I would encourage you to do that. Um, show up, have fun, make new friends and know that you're wanted. Um, you're not like coming to try out for our church family. You're coming because the door's wide open. Um, I remember our first family camp, which was kind of a weird spot because we were, we were, I was hired and it's not like I, I wasn't welcome, uh, but it was my first family camp, and we were looking around, 
we're like, man, I've never seen anything like this. How cool is this? And my wife said something, because we weren't going here very long yet. She's like, this is really cool, but it feels like everyone already has their people. And I looked at her and I said, I think you're just seeing the community, but I don't think any of those doors are closed. And so it took some effort to walk up and be like, good. I want to sit with you. And you can assume in your head, well, well, that door's closed. They don't want me to join their circle. They don't want me to sit with them. But all of those doors, all of those circles are open. And, and you just ha- it's going to take some effort if you're newer. It's going to take some effort to be like, okay, here I am. <laughs> can I hang out? <laughs> and I think you're probably way more wanted than you recognize. And, and, and Satan's going to try to keep you in isolation because that's where he does his dirtiest work when you're believing that you're alone and no one else would get you. Um, so push into that community. I, w- I would say too, um, in, in this season, I think we all make an assumption when, we've, when we're new to a space uh, or relatively new to a space that, that I think we have a tendency to think we stand out more than we actually do. Like everyone's going to know I'm new. Here, here's the thing about our church. Um, we have been growing in this season. There are lots of people who are new, and we have two services. So there are people that have been here for years who go to first service that you haven't seen in a long time because you go to second service. And you pass on Sunday, maybe in a parking lot or maybe as their car's pulling out, but you're not hanging out. So I'm, I'm telling you, you're not going to stand out as much as you, you might fear that you will. And so there's a lot of opportunity for us to, to be courageous and lean in and, and, and feel apart and connect and meet new people. So I'd, uh, I'd encourage you with that. Okay, details. We've got to get to the how and answer some questions and uh, kind of uh, uh, prime the pump a little bit. On, we said we were going to up our game uh, this year. We were going to double down on family camp and up our game. I think we've done that. Uh, this is... Uh, the largest registration we've had maybe ever, and we're doing things we've never done before. So in years past, when we were at another facility, we, we didn't have any programming. We just showed up to camp and we hung out and it just was kind of random. And you just, we hung out all weekend. That's all we did. There was no, no scheduled things. We moved to Tadmore and the place is so spread out. Uh, people were rarely in the same place at the same time. So we realized we needed to create a little bit of programming to create what we refer to as a gravity to pull us all together. So we think of it in, in, in that regard. Like we've got some events that are going to pull everybody to same spaces uh, throughout the week. And we want to hit some of those things. But first, let's, let's deal with some FAQ about registration. Walk us through registration, get everybody... Uh, yeah, so um, most of you are already registered online. If you're not yet, I had answered like 10 people's questions about, is it too late for me to still come between okay. services and how do I get there? So that's exciting. Yep. So first service worked, so, so we'll see what happens second service. Um, but it's not too late to sign up. But if you are signed up, when you get there, uh, there'll be a, a check-in booth. You can't miss it on your way in. Uh, Chris will probably be there with a little packet for you. It's going to have uh, the schedule of the weekend. It's going to have where you're staying and where everyone else is staying. And if you're like, I don't want people to know where I'm sleeping at night. Um, <laughs> too bad. Uh, they're, going, they're going to know. And it's just going to help us like, find people. Like, you don't want it to take like, eight hours to find out Especially when we're hunting Eric's down. At, at the end like, of the day, hunting down our kids has proven to be the hardest thing. Yeah. So you track down where their friends are. You need to know where people are staying. Yeah, totally. So that's going to have your schedule. Um, and we're, sh- we're wanting people to check in. Um, after four o'clock on Thursday. If you can't come up till Friday, you can come up pretty much any time. Um, but the camp has asked that we check in uh, at four. So we're shooting for four to six to be a main window. Um, but that'll be your, your check-in, and, and someone will tell you where you're at, especially if you've never been there before. Um, but there's people staying in trailers, more than trailers than ever before by a long shot. But we also have people in cabins and dorms and yurts and, and all over the place. We're taking up the whole, the whole place. Uh, and then Thursday night, um, we're going to get to uh, what we, we talked about at Vision Sunday is doing more of these like um, informal uh, family worship gatherings. So there's a place across from where we hang out at the lake. There's a place uh, up called the Fireside. It's in the woods. There's a bunch of benches and a fire pit. And we're going to have uh, just a time of worship uh, with the kids. Um, and that'll be at 830 right around sunset. We'll sing some kid songs. Um, some VBS songs, and then um, just a time of worship and prayer uh, that we get to be together. I don't know if you want to say anything else uh, t- about talk, that. Just back to registration real mm. quick. I want to say something about that, but 
T-shirts. Answer uh, that question yes. real quick. So these are cool, yeah. Um, got some new T-shirts. I've like gotten like a reputation, I don't know if it's good or bad, about having to have a T-shirt for everything we do. <laughs> and someone's like, I think I only have T-shirts that are for church events. I'm like, that's great. <laughs> um, but you can order a, a T-shirt um, today or tomorrow, and they'll be ready. She, she said you could even order them up till Tuesday night. I'm just saying, the sooner you order them, probably the better. Um, and I just got a link so you can register online. So I'll be in the back. Uh, you can sign up on paper, or I'll give you the link, and you can register online. We have them for adults and kids. They're 12 bucks. That's just what she charges us, so we're not trying to make money off of this. But uh, yeah, you can get that in the back. Um, Matt, uh, back to the, the worship night, as far as the kickoff, just really looking forward. This will be like a, a worship and, and, and family worship and prayer gathering. So we'll pray for camp as a kickoff for camp. We'll pray for one another. If you're going through a season of difficulty and would love for your church family to pray for you, we really love to do that. Our last uh, worship and prayer gathering had a lot of that. We circled up up front here and just laid hands on people and prayed like, if there's something you need prayer for, we want to open that space, and that'll kick off camp on, on Thursday. And then, uh, and then Friday, we really expect to get into full swing, because not everyone's coming up Thursday, so we expect to be in full swing. Speaking Talk of swings. Me. Speaking of swings, yeah. Uh, Friday morning from 9 to noon, the, they have this like giant swing set up up in the woods by the rope course. Uh, that'll be open 9 to noon, Friday and Saturday morning. Um, so if you're afraid of heights, this is another way to just really test your fears and, uh, or impress your kids. Like, I can't wait to show off to my kids that I can do this. <laughs> um, I saw another dude on a video that was about my size do it. So I'm like, hey, it'll hold. So uh, we're hoping uh, that it holds. But that's Thursday or Friday and Saturday morning, 9 to noon. And as soon as that shuts down, the lake opens up. And that'll be our, our kind of hub um, all afternoon from noon to six o'clock, the lake is open for swimming. They've got this big inflatable thing where you climb up the back and slide down the front, um, and canoeing and, and all the things fishing. Um, oh, speaking of fishing, they'd rather us use barbless hooks. I didn't say that first service, but um, if you're going to fish, Josh, I know you're going to be fishing, but barbless hooks only uh, in the lake. Uh, so the lake will be open uh, both days, uh, noon to six. We'll have snow cones down there. Um, we got a snow cone machine, and I'm so excited to use it. Now we're going to have snow cones at everything. Definitely. It's going to be gospel class, snow cones. It's going to be... Whoa, what about tonight? No, 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 stop it. Snow cones with the pastors. Oh, pastor's coffee. It's going to be pastor's snow cone now. <laughs> okay. I'd come. Uh, anyway, so that's uh, Friday and Saturday. The, the lake will be open all day. Friday night, uh, we're going to have uh, s snack luck and games, right? So after dinner... Um, at the place where we've had church in the past by the forum, um, there's a big tent set up. We'll have some fire pits. And everyone just brings like their favorite snack, um, especially if you're good at making cookies. Uh, we'd love for you to bring some cookies. <laughs> I would personally uh, love for you to bring some cookies to that. And we'll have a bunch of tables set up for people to play board games, cards, uh, whatever you want to do there. There's also nine square. If you've played that before at family camp, it gets kind of nuts. That'll be in the forum under the lights. Uh, so we can play until probably way too late, uh, but that'll be uh, Friday. Friday night. So, and then Saturday during the day, we've got some volleyball tournaments, basketball tournaments, all kinds of stuff going on up there. Last year, volleyball, I broke, I like broke my toe on Saturday, and then I left to go hunting Monday, which was great timing. But uh, that'll be uh, Saturday basketball and volleyball. They got a nice sand pit for volleyball there. Uh, and then Saturday night, oh my goodness. Okay, so here's what I would say. If you are not camping with us and you're considering whether or not, Saturday is the day to come up. Yeah. Uh, it is, so starting at noon, we have the lakeside. Everyone is at the lake. It's going to be a warm weekend. We've got the, the shaved ice and all that kind of stuff. It's going to be fun. And then our barbecue, we can't stay. We have to be out on Sunday by one o'clock because they have another group coming in. So we can't do our typical after church barbecue. So we're doing our potluck barbecue Saturday night, and it is going to be the, I mean, uh, barbecue is not even putting it, like it no, is a feast. It's a feast. We're having a full on Surf feast. and turf. We had to get a permit. We had to get a permit of the state of Oregon That's to crazy. ship in the crawfish from Louisiana. We, uh, on their website, it said, unless you're ordering from Oregon, you need a permit. Which Other uh, way around, we were like, but yeah. Big surprise. Yeah. We needed a permit. So we've got 
I don't know, 70 pounds of crawfish. I don't know how many brisket we're smoking. We, it is, so this is what we need you to bring. We need you to bring desserts and salads, and we've got everything else covered. Not just salads, any side, really. Any sides, yeah. yeah. So it is going to be uh, a feast for the books, uh, for sure. And then what else do we got going on in the field? So we'll have uh, our lawn game of Palooza. So we'll have a can, can jam tournament, spike ball tournament, cornhole tournament. So find a partner now, get ready to dominate that. We have trophies made for the winters, w winners, which we'll... Award on Sunday. We're going to give them out on Sunday in front of everybody. So that'll be a big deal. Um, we have inflatables for the kids. Uh, we have a, an awesome uh, blues cover band that's going to come in Saturday night. So while we're playing games and stuff, there'll be live music. And I just can't wait to hang out with you guys. Um, so I'd say if, you, if you're not going to be up for the weekend, um, for sure come Saturday, even like 12 to... Who knows how late? But it'll and, be blast. and again, let me let me say this: there, there is when you look in the old when you look in the Old Testament, there were certainly feasts and celebrations that were to commemorate certain things. But there was also an element where it was just to enhance the community, where they were to be together. The value of getting together, sharing a meal, and 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 spending this time together is big. So let me think about it like this: How important for your family personally? your personal family, how important are patio times and movie nights and camping trips in the summer? How important for the rhythm of your family is that? Okay, it's, it's not a little piece of what it means to be a family and how it enhances family. And so it is no different for the church that these kinds of celebrations and parties are good and, and, and life-giving for us as, we've, as we continue to foster that family environment. So Again, if there's only, you can't make it up the whole weekend, you're not going to camp the whole weekend. If you're going to pick a day, uh, come up on Saturday and, and enjoy, that, enjoy that with us. Okay. I'd also say if, if like, I'm sure there's people here, they're like, okay, no matter what, I can know I cannot make it next weekend. I'm going to be out of town or whatever. Like, I think just still take this as a value. And I want you to know that from us, like, we think doing church together outside of Sunday morning is such a big deal. Uh, it's important for, for us as a family to grow and thrive and worship. And so um, there will be more opportunities, um, community group, other opportunities to make, make doing life together as a church um, a, a big deal. So. And without strong arm in you, I would just say this. If you had plans for the weekend already, I'm just going to say, would you mind reconsidering? Hmm. Okay, no pressure, just go back to it. You've got a garage sale planned, okay. Uh, do you, well, just reconsider it. And that's, I'm saying that super kindly. I'm not trying to guilt anyone into it. I'm just, give it a shot. Like, just go, do we really need to? That's all. That's I'm all convinced. Okay. Sunday morning, we have church. Here's the deal. Sunday morning, church is up there. So if you're not going and, and you've reconsidered and you said, I still can't. Okay, fine. But church is up there. So we won't be here on Sunday. Service will be at 10 o'clock on Sunday. It will not be in the forum this year. It's going to be lakeside because we have some baptisms. So we're going to use the snack shack deck as a stage. And we're going to actually have church out by the lake and then have some baptisms uh, that day as well. And so... And you can sign up if you have not been baptized. And I know that's come up the last couple of weeks. Family camp is one of those places where we like to celebrate baptism. So if you've not been baptized in water, have questions about that, talk to me. You can sign up on that list in the back and uh, we'll, we'll celebrate with you on that Sunday. Yeah. A couple other things uh, that didn't come up that are FAQs um, for like fire pits and whatnot. Um, they've asked that we just do fro propane fire pits. While you're hanging out, they don't want to make the news for that reason. Um, so no bonfires in the field or anything like that. There are a couple of designated areas that they have uh, for wood fires, but uh, propane fires. And then dogs. They'd really rather you not bring your dog. Um, if you're in a trailer or somewhere where you can keep your dog like very secluded to your space, that's fine. But they don't want animals in their cabins and all that stuff. So In any of the gathering spaces, and yeah. certainly not by lakeside. Yeah, yeah They sure. make a mess. I would say this too, as far as day registrations, if you're coming up and you look at the registration, I want a day pass and it's $10 per person. You see that? It's not $10 per person per day. It's $10 buys you the pass you can use all weekend long. 
Uh, they charge us per day visitor too, not just for campers. So we're just trying to offset some of those costs. So if you want to come up, it's just $10 for the weekend. You can pop up Saturday night, come up sun, uh, Friday night, uh, and you only have to pay once. Uh, you that don't need a pass for something. You don't need multiple passes, just one. Okay? Mm-hmm.